morning, ladies and germs. Um, oh, first thing I gotta do is clean my ear. And then there's the strange person walking in front of my window. <clears throat> so it's been a while. Um, took the weekend off as I normally do. And then yesterday was kind of an extended weekend. Um, but we are back. And we are bad. I think last time we talked about multi-pitch climbing. And then I asked a bunch of guys, you know, towards the end of the thing, the last show was, um, what do you want to talk about next? Right? And that led to um, the, uh, well, for, for, okay, first off, the, uh, somebody asked me early on in the thing about cleaning multi-pitch uh, sport anchors. Like, so when you come up the anchor, how the hell do you get off, right? If you've been top roping through a, um, a fixed anchor. And good question. The thing about that process of like cleaning an anchor and then getting lowered to the ground or cleaning an anchor, setting up a rappel, um, it's a pretty simple process. But it does have a number of steps to it. And then anytime you have a number of steps to something like that, especially when you're off the ground, uh, it's good to have a system and have practiced it before you actually find yourself in that situation. The number of times, I don't know how many, like half a dozen times or something, I've been at the back of the lake guiding and um, some guy will be up at the anchor, cleaning the anchor with his buddy who already knows how to clean the anchor yelling directions from 100 feet away or 70 feet away, 60 feet away or something like that. But enough that, you know, there's room for confusion. So, you know, if the person, whether they're supposed to be setting up a rappel, but they're not quite sure how to do it or what steps are involved. And in, in a few of these times, I'm like standing right beside the guy, you know, hooking up my anchor for my clients and my guests. And I'm looking at him going like, dude, this is not the place to be learning how to do this, right? Uh, off the ground like this. If you don't know, go back down, get your buddy to come up here and clean it. And then, you know, usually there's a number of places where at any crag, uh, the guides have set up a learning area where you can actually learn and dry land this thing on the ground so that you have a process or you have a system of cleaning anchors. The other problem is uh, there's so much information out there. Like I looked up how to clean a sport anchor, right? And there was a freaking ton of this stuff out there. Uh, and most of them were pretty good. Surprisingly enough, the worst one that I've seen out of all of them was from a Canadian guide had set up. Mind you, it was like 10 years ago before we were getting the um, tethered, uh, having a tethered system of some kind. Um, And, and just using quick draws to clip into the anchor with. So whatever, she kind of botched that. Production quality was good, audio was poor. Our production quality was bad. Uh, audio was poor and uh, the camera work was poor and the whole process wasn't well thought out. So, so much for the Canadian guides. Let's get back, uh, freaking Canadians, I know. They're like, you know what Canadians are? They're the New Zealanders of North America, Frank. And I know exactly what you mean. So I thought I'll go grab a couple of slings and stuff like that. But I thought what we'd do is before I cover on how to take an anchor apart, because I looked at it probably about 20 videos and not most of them are pretty good. But some of them guys, you know, they're obviously guys that, you know, cubicle workers that our hobbyists in their, in their uh, garage showing us how to do this. And then there's a few professional types. So maybe we could talk a little bit about, you know, who to go to when you want to learn this stuff. And then also um, the, 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 how to break an anchor down. But before we do that, why don't I get us on to this chick here, Alina Arenez. And... Uh, She'll show us how to build an anchor. I'll go grab a couple of slings. Right. So anyhow, and then we'll go into how to clean top rope anchors by Outdoor Research. Outdoor Research is actually 
not too bad. They pretty uh, concise and clean about how they do their things and pretty well rehearsed. They're also using this AMG. You know, that's the thing too, is if you're looking at these videos, um, I would suggest, and that's not to say that the hobbyists are bad or they're going to do, a, a, you know, an improper um, technique or anything like that. But if you're brand new to this game and you're starting to learn, go with somebody, some of these certified uh, things or else go with a company, um, whether it's climbing, rock and ice, uh, the American Alpine Club. I'm talking about Americans, but that could also go with the British uh equivalent of that um that glencoe in scotland has some really good videos but when you get companies like that that are putting their accreditation on the line putting their company's name on it um you can almost be certain that uh um they're going to try and do a good job of it and and do it clean and concise because if it's unsafe the process or the methods that they're using then that's going to be pointed out and it's not going to look good for their companies so outdoor research it's a well-known uh, equipment provider outdoor equipment provider and that's who's been providing this but it's also been backed by the amj the alpine club of uh, america and has a bunch of other sponsors so why don't the, we check out elena hey elena baby let's do this Okay, and then we'll go right back to here, and let's talk to Elena. Hi, I'm Elena Renz, a &J Certified Rock Guide. I'm gonna show you my favorite ways to set up a top rope anchor when you have two bolts at the top of a climb. The first method, I'm gonna clip my quick draw underneath any existing hardware there, directly into the hanger. These particular pieces of gear we don't see very often at all. So maybe one out of every well, I don't know. I've done that much sport climbing lately, but not. I haven't seen these things very often. It's not to say they're not a bad idea. They'll actually work as long as these springs are intact. Um, but if you're in Canada and most of the other places, I don't see this particular setup um, as the norm. This this particular this deal right here and this hook here would be an exception to that. The reason why I want to do it this way, because I want to be sure that my carabiner is not going to get potentially cross-loaded across any of that fixed hardware. I'm going to attach two quick draws, one on each bolt with the gates opposite and opposed. Then I attach my climbing rope and lower to the ground. This is a great method if I'm arriving at the anchor and I quickly want to lower back down and maybe it's just a friend and I who are going to be top roping on this for a short term period of time. The next method you can see, I have one double locking quick draw. And this is great if I expect I'm going to have a little bit more time top roping off that anchor. The locking quick draw provides a little bit more security for several people top roping off of it. And it's quick and easy to install. If the top rope's going to be up for a while and have a bunch of people who are going to be climbing on it, I'm going to use something slightly more secure. I'm gonna take a 48 inch sling with two non-lockers, attach that to my two bolt underneath the hardware like we talked about. I wanna be sure that that bar tack is up and out of the way. So when I go to tie my master point, which can either be an overhand on a bite or a feet on the bite, depending on the height of that master point. If I choose to do an overhand here, here's a pro tip for you. Take any extra non-locking carabiner and attach it directly into that overhand on a bite. So after this has been top roped on all day, it makes that overhand much easier to un- This isn't actually bad advice at all. The uh, If you're just doing an overhand knot and even a figure eight, figure eight is slightly easier to undo, but um, uh, an overhand knot is just going to cinch up, especially if you're, you know, using it for a number of times uh, during the day and people are loading it and shock loading it. They can get pretty tight and be a bit of a pain in the ass to take apart. Throwing this carabiner in there will simplify that process. Untie. Last step, add two locking carabiners to the master point. Tighten everything down. 
Put in your climbing rope. Boom, boom. And then screw the gates down so you don't screw up. So if you do attach a non-locking carabiner into that overhand, you want to be sure that nothing else gets clipped into it. Another pro tip, take a non-locking carabiner, clip it between the two lockers, clip the rope in. The reason why I'm doing this is not for any extra added security. The wider radius for the rope to pass over is going to increase the product life of my climbing rope and my locking carabiners. My final go-to is the quad. Again, a non-locking carabiner underneath the hardware. I'm going to double up my sling, keeping that bar tack isolated at the end. I'm going to tie an overhand knot about a third of the distance on one end. I'm going to tie a second overhand knot about a third of the distance on the opposite end. Experiment with different materials for constructing your quad. In this case, I'm using a Dyneema sling because the anchor is free and clear. It's not rubbing against anything. If I were concerned about any sort of friction of the material being top roped on for a long period of time, I might use a cordelette to do the same. The reason why I use overhand knots is because they're easier to adjust. I want to move those down as close to my master point carabiners as possible to limit any possible extensions should one side release. I'm going to take two locking carabiners, again, opposite and opposed. I'm going to isolate the strands two and two and clip those carabiners to each one of those. So I'm becoming a, well, a bit of a fan of these quads here. This uh, this quad sling system, at, at first glance when I saw it in a book, I was going, oh, well, it does need all the you know, for the redundancy, extension, equalization, and stuff like that. It actually works really well with that. And I do like the separation of uh, um, being able, you know, to hook, I could hook a blade into one, people into another. Uh, rescue system would be awesome. I mean, separation of uh, your equipment would work really well. And it's definitely strong, seeing as you have four pieces of material here and four pieces of material there. Um, it's more than strong enough. So, yeah, the quad. Um, I'm going to start playing around with that a little bit more. And then I can attach the rope. Once the rope is attached to your carabiners, you're going to screw down so you don't screw up. And now you have a perfectly self-equalizing top rope anchor that you can use to top rope multiple lines off of one point. What you definitely don't want to do is clip all four strands because should the anchor come unclipped, from one side. A best practice is to not top rope through the fixed hardware. So we always wanna attach our rope with our own materials and then remove it when we're done climbing at the end of the day. Mussy hooks are great for lowering off of. I simply clip my rope into each one of them, paying attention to which way they naturally hang. Oftentimes they're not designed to be clipped opposite and opposed. Sometimes they are, so you need to be paying attention to how they naturally rest. Remember, mussy hooks are there for the final lower off, and they are not intended to be top roped off of. Another way to set up a top rope anchor. What do they call those things? Muffy hooks? Muffy hooks? Murphy hooks? Murphy hooks? Is to thread the rope through the chain. But in this configuration, we've added a locking carabiner above the chain. This isn't a bad practice here, you guys. Uh, this is pretty common in our neighborhood here in Canada, in the Bow Valley, just finding these chains at the end of the line. Um, I haven't really seen this set up too much where you're running, basically running the uh, rope through these chains, but the chains aren't taking any force. The carabiner is, is what's getting worn here. And the big concern for people, I and mean, I'm not sure, well, I can understand why they do that, because they don't do any fucking fixing of gear themselves. Uh, but in my neighborhood, if I see gear that's worn out, I carry a few of these, a um, uh, couple of bolt hangers, some uh, bolt threads, or bolt, or some nuts, 
and things like that as part of my standard cragging thing. And I might even have a piece of chain or two in there. So if I find stuff that's worn out, I have no problem replacing it. If, you know, and it's, it's all a matter of taking care of your own crag. So if you're uh, the type of person who, you know, goes to a similar crag and that's kind of your home crag all the time, think about taking along a little bit of gear, you know, maybe a wire brush to clean some stuff once in a while. It starts to get a little greased. Uh, you see any hardware that needs fixing? See this here, you can put these into this point here and all you have to do is change out these right and the chain just stays the same all the time so you bring a couple extra of these add them to the ends of the chain and then you can top rope through the chain i don't really freak out too much about top roping through these chains they take an awful lot um, once they start to show a little bit of wear i just fucking change them out but that's me and that's my neighborhood and that's what i do i kind of take, take care and, and do some of the uh maintenance on my hood so the carabiner is taking all of the friction, which is not inducing any extra wear on our fixed hardware. This has a couple different benefits, such as I don't have to come back up and clean an anchor, which is especially helpful if the last person climbing is unfamiliar with how to do that. Practice these on your own time before your life is on the line. Alrighty, so this is the uh, technique used depends on its intended job. Okay, do not top rope directly through fixed hardware. This is an etiquette thing mostly, um, and it's something that is being pretty drilled into kids these days. And I guess that's not a bad thing. I don't do it sometimes, especially with those cold shut uh, steel rings, which can... I've never ever seen one of those things because they don't wear in the same place. So like those steel uh, um, pencil rings that you see on fixed hardware. So if they don't wear in the same place, it doesn't really um, wear out. And I've never seen a worn out cold shut welded steel ring in my life anywhere. People say they have, I kind of don't believe them, but if they say they have, then I'll have to assume they have. And lowering once from fixed hardware is acceptable. So, yeah. Um, no big deal. This was produced by the Alpine Club and... Yeah. American Mountain Guides Association put their names on it. The Mountaineers, Petzl Outdoor Research, all big companies to hire a guide or to visit AMGA, Qualified Woo! Square Blue Productions. Okay, that's about all we need to know about that shit. Um, <clears throat> so we know how an anchor is built now, right? With the uh, opposing um, carabiners and slings. Problem is, there's just more than one way to build an anchor. But the principles of cleaning a top rope anchor are pretty much the same. Doesn't matter what the configuration is. I don't know if I'm explaining this well. Anyhow, out of all the videos that I saw, I kind of liked this one the best. Are you? What goes up must come down. Cleaning an anchor isn't a complicated process, but the transition from climbing... Okay, I take that back. So why do we use anchors? Like, I've got two chains right here. Why don't I just, like, throw the rope through those chains? We all do a top rope lap, and then we pull the rope, and no one has to go back up. To reduce the wear on the, on the stuff that's out there. Exactly. You know, all this fixed gear, someone went to a lot of work to put it in. Um, and if you top rope, if your rope's going through this stuff, weighted, it's going to wear it out super fast, especially so in the desert. And especially so like this, when the, the sand gets a little wet, because it kind of sticks to the rope. And then uh, it makes the rope more abrasive. And it's amazing how quickly things will wear out. This, this carabiner is probably only a few months old. And look at it. That's just from oh, yeah. delay and uh, repelling on it here in the desert. So Simon Parbusing and I worked on a gig one time, and uh, 
at the back of the lake, we, we had one of those kind of drizzly rainy days sort of thing, and our ropes picked up a bunch of sand. And we were just both assistant guides, but we were in charge of this rock climbing operation. And we had worn a rope or one of these carabiners through probably to this point right here. Um, we had the British Army or Canadian Army, British Army. We were guiding that and that particular day. And in a single day, we almost cut this carabiner in half without and either neither one of us really knew what was going on. Like and then we come down, we, we rig out our things. Kevin cornered Mike. Did you check out the LSD method? Uh, no, I haven't. Sorry, Kevin. I'll get back on you. The uh, so anyhow, we wore this out in in a single in like a four hour period. We almost top roped an entire carabiner, the aluminum of a carabiner, from having sand embedded into the rope sheath and then top roping on it constantly throughout the day. So I that kind of surprised me which kind of brings us back uh frank climbs says uh steel beaners for top ropes heaps nicer for your rope never wear out less friction for blair to deal with yeah if you want to get a steel beaner i don't know where you get those uh probably from some sort of industrial setup um so the tree surgeon dudes arborists have uh their specialty equipment that sort of thing um other than that, I would say, yeah, you might be able to find one at your local climbing. And like a steel carabiner will last significantly longer. It's not the kind of thing that you would take on a multi-pitch climb or anything like that where weight is an issue. I haven't seen this video, but... Uh, the stuff wears out really quick and we want this gear to last. So manufacturer's recommendation for wear on like carabiner's blade devices is a millimeter of wear. And so the way you measure that is just put it up next to a new one and kind of uh, use something to measure measure that. Once a good groove starts to get in there, I get too much friction on the rope and it kind of makes it difficult to use. When you see people clean anchors, go back and get the gear at the end of the day, there's two ways to do it. They can go up, untie, feed the rope through and get lowered, or they can go up, rig the rope to the middle through these anchors and then rappel down. So wait, when you wait. get down to the bottom and you come off rappel, you pull the rope and it's going through here with no weight at all. Mm -hmm. So if you lower, it's the weighted rope on there. And although it's just one time for every group, it's still going to wear the stuff out quicker. So generally preferred to repel. Sometimes on like super overhanging sport routes, it's tough to like repel down and clean the gear. So it's a little bit more acceptable to uh, just be lowered down at that point. The most common mistake where people get hurt and super experienced people have gotten hurt before is the Blair thinks that I'm going to repel. I think that I'm going to be lowered. I go up, I clean the anchor, I say take, I lean back. This guy's got a good point here with this, man. Oh, yeah? Frank Klein says this dude, who is Doug Foist, uh, certified rock guide with the AMGA, makes a... Uh, has a great web page about anchor configurations and so i would suggest you go and have a look at it anytime anybody throws their accreditation onto something they're kind of putting their uh their reputation on the line so i, I kind of use that as a uh, i don't know as a benchmark i would say he played live tv um but anyhow what he was saying there about communication so this is the blair I'm the climber, say I'm the big fat green guy. I actually got, I'm kind of looking like him these days. I used to be way honed, you know, like ripped. Yeah, I'd be walking, I'd take my shirt off like a sport climber everywhere I went and uh, threw it on the ground. So that people could check out my abs. I don't do that anymore, but I'm getting off topic now. <clears throat> so, communicate with your belayer let them know because if you have a preferred method what you're going to do you know what you're going to do when you get there and you should know what you're going to do so that way you'll have the equipment that you need to get there you notice that he hooked up that uh sling that tether line which would be something like this right and just a simple double length sling is all you need so you can girth hitch it through your harness or girth hitch is just a matter of looping it through and then taking one end, looping it through. And there I am on my belay point of my harness, right? So that's girth hitch. 
And then you may want the option of just adding a couple of knots in there. So if you can shorten or shorten it, if you feel like with using another carabiner and I probably put about two in there myself. So that I have a distinctive end. I might even throw another one in there just so that when I clip my locking carabiner in, it doesn't float around or anything. It's just stuck at the end. Then I can always take another carabiner and shorten up onto it. So it doesn't take, it doesn't take anything specific, you know, or any gear that you wouldn't normally have. Um, check out my flaps. Don't check out my abs. I check out my flaps, Frank says. Uh, and then the other one, this is probably more common for me, but I also use this as sort of an anchor type setup, especially ice climbing these days, but uh, even in summer. But I carry a couple of these. I, I have them in my pack. One's for my daughter, but when we come into repel mode, this is my daughter's, it's a little bit shorter. Um, same sort of thing. All you do is girth hitch into this thing. But what I like about these is that the freaking bomber, man. So you can just girth hitch into the tight part of your harness. And each of these links, you know, is like the full strength, 6,000 pound sort of whatever 40 kilonewton 30 hits take to break those things apart which is impossible kind of forces to create in the real world no matter what you did if you had a dynamic rope a belay of any sort and uh you would you would you couldn't break one of these uh sewn sling things apart and of course the other piece of gear that is what you guys call the cordelette and I guess that's what it is. We call it here in Canada, we call it a Prusik cord because essentially we, Prusiks are our main go-to on our rescue systems. And that's just what we've always called them. And then uh, in America, in America, they call it the Prusik, or they call it the Cordelette, which has a French sort of sound to it, which I find odd for the Americans since they, France wouldn't join them in the Iraq war, they pulled out. Um, and so they had a freedom fries, which was great for a while. So you realize they're just like all the rest of the fries. And no one's holding the other end of the rope. You know, nice quiet crag like this probably wouldn't happen. But if there's like a road or a river or something down here where there's a lot of people climbing, speaking over each other, like that communication could happen very simple. So first thing is I'm going to have a discussion with my Blair. And I'm going to go up. Um, I'm just going to wrap down. So once you take me off the leg. You're okay. good to go. Okay, so you're going to repel down? Yes, I am. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Um, I'm all speed buckles on my harness. I got a good knot through both my time points. Okay, I got I'm just your waist since we haven't climbed anything today. You got a yep. speed buckle? Awesome. <laughs> For cleaning, there's three steps. I, I look at like three big steps instead of like trying to remember every little thing because anchor configurations are always going to be different at the top. Um, and one thing. When I set up an anchor, I never want to put my carabiners through the bottom links or the uh, the wrap rings because I need to feed my rope through that, and that's just going to be awkward. Um, so step number one is right now my, my safety's on the rope. I need to transfer myself from the rope. Does this guy have all of his his carabiner through this quad thing through all four pieces of rope it kind of looks like it maybe this one is left out through the anchor you've got your personal your fancy pencil device a lot of times i use a double length sling um pas is really good for this um and I, i'll bring a pas out sometimes when i'm sport climbing but i like kind of multi-use so i just use a sling double length sling and i girth hitch it to myself so super simple for my to attach myself. I can just clip my two strands up here, unlocked. Um, the thing about this, since we have a quad anchor that attaches these two bolts together. I'm guessing he left this strand out. And so he's got these three strands clipped in. Ethically, uh, you couldn't actually clip all four strands safely. Hector, great. In case, in case one of these bolts failed. First, I can just clip into the quad and I'm good. I'm never gonna trust my life to a piece of gear I don't own, which is a bolt. Mm -hmm. So right now I'm actually attached to both of these bolts through the quad anchor. Mm -hmm. If we were up here on an anchor that was maybe like 
two draws with blockers, I'd have to clip into this chain and that chain to be attached to them because these two, like two draws, would be uh, would be separate from each other. I just attached myself to the anchor, and now any time I transfer my life from one system to another, I'm going to double check first. And sometimes I'll even talk to myself and verbalize it in anchor because this is the point where, like, on our own, we don't have a partner to double check us. So cool. I've got a good girth hitch. Sheep. It's not a bad idea, eh? Having a system of verbalization on that. Okay, Frank Klein says, Sterlings make a nylon sewn sling at a 60 inch length is a fire rescue product, handy for guiding, because you make you can move around the anchor heaps more. Heaps more. That's just a Aussie giveaway when you say heaps, huh? Strawby seven. I use Petzl Connect Adjust Lanyard. Very efficient, though not as versatile. Yeah, I see those lanyards by Petzl are becoming more and more popular. Um, oh man, I kind of keep things a little bit simple. I wouldn't mind having one for some stuff, but uh, having that Swiss Army harness with all those freaking things around, I kind of keep it a lot cleaner than that. G generally speaking, I'm not saying that that's wrong. Whatever method works for you is probably the best. Here, I am locked into the anchor on two strands. And you can take me off the leg. So first thing I want to do is I'm going to pull up a little slack. So step one was transferring my life from the rope to the anchor. Step two is going to be rigging the rope. And then step three is transferring my life back from the anchor to the rope. So we're in step two, rigging the rope right now. I'm going to have to untie for this. So I want to make sure I don't lose my rope because then my friends would laugh at me and probably <laughs> sit at the base. Knowing my friends, they'd make me sit up there for a couple hours and then they'd come and get me. So that's never happened and I really don't want to go through that. So I can tie a knot in this. I can do an overhand or an eight on a bite. I prefer just to uh, clove hitch it, throw it on a carabiner so I'm not going to lose it. Now I can untie. Here's an important step, guys. You don't want to be losing that rope, right? So, yeah, always clip your rope off before you start uh, dicking around, tying and untying things and re-threading it. Um, yeah, so let's just carry on. This guy's actually, that's not too bad. Okay, oh, now what's he doing? Rings. So he's going through the bottom of the chain. You should stay. I don't like take off. <laughs> it does go to the bathroom. I'll be right back. You know what I mean? I I could. Like, you just stay around. That that's not a bad idea at all. And if I I'm actually when I repel, I'm gonna use my own backup. But if I wasn't doing that, I could ask Anna when I repel to give me a fireman's belay. Always good to have a backup when you're repelling, like that's repelling is where a lot of climbers get hurt and killed. So, so my rope's through here. I want to close the system now. So I'm just going to tie a barrel knot. And now this way, I'm still going to hold on to this, but I can come out of here. And if I did lose this, like, especially with these chains, there's no way that's going to go through. Mm -hmm. I could feasibly go through a wrap ring, but it's probably hung up. So now I want to rig the rope to where both ends are on the ground. So depending on how long this rope it, Yeah, you know, those barrel knots. I, when I, I'm in a controlled environment, like something like this or a crag, and I know that both ends are going to be on the ground, I'm, I don't bother with them. Uh, you're not wrong if you do, and I guess I really shouldn't say you don't do that. On the other hand, let me think. One, two, three. The last four repel incidents that we've had here in the Rockies, all of those fatalities could have been uh, solved by putting a knot into the end of the rope. So actually, most of the time, uh, especially on multi-pitch climbs, it is a very, very good idea to uh, put those knots in the end of the rope. Just get into the process of a method that makes sure you don't forget before you start pulling the ropes up. I've done that a couple of times. Fortunately, they've never gotten so far up that uh, I couldn't um, uh, retrieve them. But yeah, that would be bad. Also, another thing though, this is what happens. It seems like one out of every thousand climbs that I do, 
when I'm pulling the rope, the rope will start whipping up and it'll go in such a way that it ties a knot into itself and bang, uh, my rope is stuck. That happened on uh, the trophy wall on Sea of Vapors. I ended up losing a brand new rope there and a couple other places, but it probably happened about three times in my life when I'm pulling ropes where um, uh, just the whipping of the rope, the rope action, tied a knot into the end of the rope and then just left my rope stranded and wouldn't come through the chains right here. Is I might have to go all the way to the middle of the rope. What I'd have to do is pull up this end all the way and then the way I'm coiling this, coil both sides of it, pulling it through so I know when it goes tight, that is the middle. A little bit more work. You know, if I can see the ground, no big deal. Then I can just toss it down and see that it's on the ground. If I can't see the ground, I don't know where the middle is and my partner is still there. I could communicate with my partner to find that. So I pull enough rope through for the ground, throw it down rope. Awesome, my rope is set up. So I'm gonna set up an extended rappel with a backup, which is a pretty standard way a lot of people do things. So I can do what's called a friction hitch off my belay loop. The type, there's different types of friction hitches. I'm gonna use what's called an auto block. So I'll take both strands. So this is called a Prusik loop and it's just five or six millimeters. You know, I very rarely do this at a crag or even ice climbing. Um, if I know where I'm going and like I'm not going into space or I'm not hanging down, I will do it on big ice climbs with if i'm the first one down and i have to stop and i know i'm going to have to build an anchor then i will use one of these backups and i'll use them anytime when i'm worried about an overhead hazard so when i'm wrapping down especially here in the rockies this uh loose rock sort of thing that i might bring down on myself or the weighing of the rope might bring it down on itself or if i have to hang out in space and build an anchor i will have that um I try to get my second or my clients not to put some of them just insist on putting those things on, but it really slows down the process. And especially when I can uh, belay them from below, uh, it, it will speed up. But a lot of people, you know, whatever, when they only repel like half a dozen times a year and they throw these slings on these things on, they don't do a very good job of it, uh, of repelling and uh, it tightens up on them a lot and it just whatever adds a lot of time to your day and that isn't required so you gotta ask yourself do you really need it i can see both uh slings on the ground am i gonna pass out between in the 50 feet back to the ground no probably not am i gonna get hit by rock probably not on a clean climbing area sport climbing area um i'm wearing a helmet anyhow so yeah i don't know uh that's up to you you're not wrong for doing that that's just kind of the way i do it Peter accessory cord um, I find a good length for this is 48 inches, and then the ends tied together with the double fishermans. Um, they make one called the hollow block. It's kind of more of a braided, a little more expensive, kind of a fancy one. Um, but yeah, just five or six mil accessory cord. I'm gonna start with it through a carabiner, and I always like to make sure I'm keeping my knots in this, like out of the middle of the system. So I'm gonna start with it right by the carabiner. Take my two ropes, and then with two ropes, probably about three wraps is the amount of friction I want. Two, three. Actually, these ropes are a little slick. I'm going to go one more, four. Lock back the other end, goes back through the carabiner, I lock that. So this, if I pull, is going to hold the rope, and if I just push down on it, the rope slides through. Um, the auto block is a friction hitch with the least amount of friction and it's going to be below my rappel device. So I don't need a whole lot of holding power. I'm not like falling right on this and having it hold my body weight. I just need to act like a hand under a belay device in case something happens to me. Um, so if I've got all this weight hanging from the rope, one of the cool things about this too, is I can just pull up slack. And if that rope's pulling down, it's gonna keep slack here and make it easier to get my rappel device on the rope. Since I've got this off my belay loop, I don't want it going up into my device, so I can use it on this extension. Works very well with the PAS. I think you can rig it away with your Petzl thing, Jim. Um, so I clip through both these strands. I'm gonna go teeth down. That's more friction. If you've got this style device and you're a lighter person, you can go teeth up, which will be less friction. Take a bite on both ropes, make sure everything's nice and clean. 
into my repel device. And then very important, make sure I clip both strands. Lock my carabiner. Cool, now I can test this system out. Sweet, so I'm no longer. So you guys can see this device is off of his belay loop or this this uh, hitch. What do you call that again? This freaking hitch? Yeah, Stroppy, I, I exactly do that. He's, um, if you're cleaning gear on the way down, this is really handy to have because you can stop anywhere. This device, like I say, is below the belay device, right? So it doesn't require a ton of friction to uh, to stop this device, barely any at all, because your hand doesn't, you know, your hand isn't that strong, and you can just close it and bang and stop your rappel at any time. And so if you let go of this, or if you're cleaning gear or building an anchor, having this underneath, um, especially if you're cleaning gear, then you can just clean, wrap the gear, put it on, and then it's easy enough to uncinch this because it's basically just holding like loosely hand tight um, because this is taking most of the friction right in here. It took me a while to get used to this system, like this belay device being so far away from my harness because essentially for the first 25 years or something like that, I just clipped right into my harness at the belay loop, just like everybody else does. Um, but since we started adding these kind of newer things and I do like, what another thing I like about this is anything fails here or here on this device you are loaded right directly onto a hard point on your harness um prior to this when we first started doing this we used to link it into our uh, leg loops to keep the um and that was because we didn't extend the repel device we still were put, clipping it directly into our harness and so in order to keep that separation from your repel device and this so that this sling didn't get pulled into the device and make the device useless, we used to clip it down lower into your leg loop, was, which was a pretty bad place to actually uh, hook it because your leg loops weren't designed for that and it could just loosen off your, your leg straps and things like that or, I don't know, just it just wasn't really that efficient. Once you started expanding or extending <clears throat> your belay loop, so that you had an extension on it and kept it up there. It was easy, real easy to, to have this directly onto your hard point of your belay loop on your harness. And I just liked it way, way better. God, I'm this anchor. I'm just on my repel device with this, uh, this back. Yeah, I know. Some of the are great for this, right? System. Um, so I just finished step two. I rigged the repel. So step three is I'm putting my life back on the rope. Again, I'm going to double check. I can either start at the bottom or start at the top. I like to start at the top. So the ropes through both my rings. I'm captured on both strands of the carabiner. I'm captured here. I'm captured there. I've got a backup. Sweet. I can come out of the anchor now. So you definitely have to go through this whole system of uh, making sure that you're hooked up correctly. Double check your system. Remember, this is the part where you're going to uh, uh, be eliminating that anchor that you had constructed and that you initially came up on. And so you really do have to take your time, walk, talk yourself through it, walk yourself through it, um, and just make sure that you're backed up. In, in as he said in here, like, you know, your, your belay is hooked up correctly. This extension is hooked up correctly. So you're captured as he uses the word captured, I guess. And then uh, if you're gonna use a backup, which um, I probably, in this situation, I don't know if I would or wouldn't. He's demonstrating he's doing the, the right thing. Something um, Frank, oh, Strawby7 said here, I've seen a guy wrapping the loose ends of the rope around his side two times. That's what I do when I come down. Even if I do have that back up uh, below me, then I just sort of, whatever, wrap the, the tail end of the rope, the, tarts, the part that's below me, around my leg a couple of times. And that puts me as a backup to my backup to my already safe system, and I don't have to worry about it. If I don't put a backup, the, uh, um, the knot, you know, or the sling or the hitch below this, 
then I can just use that method of I put this back to my belay loop and actually wrapping a couple of straps around my my tie. So now I can and then I put my foot back on the wall and here to do and actually laughing. clean the anchor. It's always important to remember that because it's kind of easy to forget sometimes. <laughs> Get back to the ground. Where's the anchor? And now I can just I like to go a hand down below my. Always important to remember that because it's kind of easy to forget. So you can see here he did leave one strand out, right? So yeah, you couldn't use a quad anchor that way. Um, if you were to clip all four, that would be a real weakness in the system and a real flaw in the system. So even though he was top roping off of these two uh, or off this anchor, he was using the three strands and not all four strands, which would make a failure point on either side where they could give out. I know that doesn't make any sense. I can barely understand Sometimes. it myself. And I know everything. Get back to the ground. Where's the anchor? And now I can just, I like to go a hand down below my friction hitch and then use my top hand just to unlock it and then keep it unlocked. And I can repel down if I let go. You never want to like just blindly let go and trust it. You, and you get like different sheaths if they're super slick. You might not get as good a friction and like need an extra wrap so it's always good to test these out a little bit with this specific friction hitch and specific rope to make sure it is locking if it ever is a little slippery and you need to stop you can just pull up like that and that usually engages it if let's say maybe i toss the ropes and they're tangled around something and i need to like mess with that and recoil the ropes or some sort of shenanigans an extra safety thing i could do is just tie a overhand on a bite that's called a catastrophe knot now, if I was like doing something here for a while like, and hit this by accident, no way it's going to go past that knot too. There's actually another way to do this, that, uh, but it's got kind of a weak link to the system. If I didn't have an extension here and I wanted to repel right off my harness, I can put the friction hitch on my leg. This is what I was talking about. And I actually guys. do use this technique quite often. If I go off my leg loop, I want to go on the inside by my uh, by my inner thigh why would i not want to put this over here it hooks onto the buckle and eric can link into the because buckle could, like undo my buckle in my leg loop could oh yeah i nailed it i nailed it this technique you want uh -huh. to oh yeah inner part of your harness right here so essentially this is how we used to do it back in the day most of the time are having someone down the road do the fireman's belay? Uh -huh. Are you having them since you did get one without you having them hold both? Both ropes, correct. So they're just like your brake hand. If you lost control, like when I want to stop, I pull down on the brake strands. Mm -hmm. So they'd be doing the same thing. If I wanted to stop, they'd pull down on the brake strands and they'd stop me. Um, so I can do my friction hitch down here. So if we looked at what I was just talking about, like what do you gain and what do you lose? Less piece of equipment, faster, like a couple. I don't know if it's faster, but you also, you don't have that extended hitch for clipping into the uh, anchor whip, uh, the extended runner, which is just a, a, a much simpler way of doing things, right? And much cleaner. Uh, rather than using two quick draws or whatever your system um, may involve. Uh, yeah, and I, you know, I, I, I would start, if you're just learning out, why not just get it going? Frank Klein said, I once got my harness near pulled off of me doing this. Yeah, I've also had my uh, leg loops open up on uh, doing this, putting it in the wrong position. And in this lower, uh, where he's clipped it in here, gets dangerously close to the belay device when it's fully extended. So if you have, depending on the length of this runner here, um, you're going to have to test it before you go off. So if I had to suggest anything, I would do the extended and, uh, and having something to clip into the anchor with is probably the way I would recommend it things that are pretty cool but there is one major weakness to this system if i turn my body that way this can get sucked up it can get jammed in there it can make it not work so if i'm doing it this way i have to be very conscious of my body position not to spin my hips that way and maybe if a rock did hit me in my i like hung that way that could undo it so there are a couple of like pretty big weaknesses in that system all right so, dude, 
This wasn't actually, I never even saw this one before. Who's this guy? How to clean top rope anchor via repelling. There is one other, and I think it is how to clean top rope anchors. This one here by Outdoor Research. The last one we're going to look at, but I like this one the best so far. Ooh, look at that knife. Nice for this time. It looks savagely sharp, I can already tell you. I was thinking about getting one of these. Funny, eh? Look how they track me. Do -do -do. Hi, I'm Dale Remsberg, AMJ instructor team member. So, this is Dale Remsberg, AMGA instructor team member, American Mountain Guides. AMG. So this guy throwing his accreditation out there right away. This configuration of anchors, uh, the two opposing quick draws, like the gates are opposing on the bottom here, is probably the most common sport climbing anchor that we use here in the Rockies. Frank climbs that straw. As long as I know what I'm saying, I'll flip you. Frank, I think your phrase could use a little more work. I once got my harness near pulled off me from doing this. Things like the paws are awesome for extending techniques. Um, what I like about this one is the guy is actually being weighted onto the anchor, right? So this is, and the, uh, all of these things like these carabiners and these links and things like that and all this transfer and stuff like that act a little bit differently when you're using real weight and also when you're looking down and it's whatever 60 or 80 feet to the ground below you um that adds a, a factor into it like a mental factor especially if you're new to this sort of thing the key is just go slow use the uh technique that you've practiced at your climbing gym or down at the base of the crag you shouldn't at this point have to yell down and ask for directions if you feel like you do have to then just lower off and get your friend to do it. You're just not ready to uh, take on this sort of system. Anything that you fuck up at this level, is you're going to end up down on the ground and uh, ain't going to be good. So let's watch uh, Dale's version of this. And this is also another outdoor research. It's got 49.2 thousand views. And it has 4,112 likes and only 71 dislikes i wonder what they dislike about it and we'll find out let's have a look cleaning an anchor at the top specifically sport climbing is a pretty easy skill but one that gets done improperly a lot of the time it can lead to you know really catastrophic accidents if done completely wrong or just not have uh, been done and with best practices. So I'm gonna give you a few skills here that are fundamental and then you can mix and match tools depending on what kind of anchor config, uh, what type of anchor configuration you come across. I've just top roped up to the top of the sport climb that my partner put up and I'm gonna clean these quick draws off of the anchor. In this case, they used a locking quick draw uh, on the anchor just to provide a little more security. There's I do this too, you guys. I have at least one locking quick draw. Uh, I usually carry a couple of them. Sometimes when I'm pulling like a really crux move where I know I'm gonna take a bit of a run out over, over a roof and something like that, and uh, have the potential for falling, this, I know it doesn't make any difference, technically, you know, the, a regular quick draw, but somehow in my mind, I, if I clip it and lock it, I'm somehow safer, right? And uh, I know that's all a mental thing, but whatever. The other thing I noticed on this uh, particular configuration is these guys, all the other ones I've seen, uh, these guys put this particular piece of gear underneath these chains because they, you know, they were saying, I'll oh, worry about cross loading. I don't really see cross loading to be an issue. It's one of those things that people, somebody says or somebody makes up and then all of a sudden um, everybody repeats it and in this particular case, and just about every case that I've seen, if these chains are like a size like this, is no, or normal mammalian size sort of thing, I've never seen these things really cross load. And I don't know what they're talking about when they say that, but they're not wrong to do it. And you're probably, if you're going to take a course, probably anytime in the next 
year or so, or probably from now, this point forward, everybody's going to be having this carabiner is going to be underneath these chains. Climate, my partner put up, and I'm going to clean these quick draws off of the anchor. In this case, they used a locking quick draw uh, on the anchor just to provide a little more security. There's a number of different anchor configurations you'll see for sport climbing. This is one common one that guides use a lot. Uh, one non-locking draw and one locker draw, opposite and opposed down here. So what I did is I attached a PAS to my harness before I came up knowing that I was going to clean this anchor. And this is the Sterling chain reactor here. And I'm going to kind of choose my length here a little bit. So I'm going to go up. and. So we're back into the States and it's the acronyms again. Woo, just blew my brains out. Um, PAS, personal anchoring system, I guess that's called. Somebody else said that, Frank or somebody mentioned PAS. So Americans are big on serene, reen, bunch of other things. Uh, acronyms are their thing. Not really my thing, but because I always have trouble remembering them. Clip into the anchor, lock that, and then I'm going to take another quick draw, clip to the other bolt and kind of choose a length there that kind of mimics the, the other length. In this case, I'm going to rock over, clip that in, and now I'm into two points mostly equalized. Slack. So this is getting a little crowded in here, eh? Um, I'm not saying it's right, not saying it's wrong, but I could probably, I'd be okay with clipping into this here. Uh, just so I don't overcrowd that carabiner, especially if I'm locked up into a carabiner on the other side over there. So, um, and I'm going to be lowering off these things in a minute, so I must I must trust them to some degree. But yeah, it's getting a little crowded with three carabiners or three three pieces of metal in that one bolt hanger. A larger bolt hanger would be nice. Now, notice I called for slack and not off belay. That's a critical mistake that leads to a lot of errors around the world where the person says off belay, but they <laughs> sure. actually just mean slack. And I'm going to lower it's off of the sport you. climb, not repel. You know what? That's what I had for mean, breakfast this uh, morning maple syrup. The, AMGA, the American Alpine Club, we all recommend that we lower off these anchors. They were easily replaceable, and it's a safer overall way to get off of sport climbs. So now that I have slack, I'm gonna, there's a couple things I can do here. If these chains are big enough to pass a bite of rope through, that's gonna be my, con, uh, my preferred configuration. In this case, it looks like they are. So I'm gonna unclip from these quick draws. I'm still tied in, so I can't drop the rope. I'm gonna pull up a bite of rope, and I'm gonna squeeze it through these chain links. So this is my preferred method, you guys. If you can get that bite of rope through the bottom um, chain links or the uh, hangers, or not the hangers, um, those petzl rings, those uh, rappel rings, um, then that's the way I go. I use this system, which is, in this case around here, I would say eight out of 10 anchors. You could probably do that. The beauty of lowering off, and especially this particular technique, is I'm on belay the entire time. Pull a bite through. I'm going to tie a bite knot. In this case, the overhand on a bite could be a figure eight on a bite as well. I'm going to grab a locking carabiner and clip this to my belay loop. Lock it. Make sure it's locked. Okay. Now, what I can do... Just at this point, guys, just make sure that you've threaded it through the chains. What you done, it's pretty hard to screw this up, but if you did screw it up at this point, she'd be all over it but the crying. Chloe Cossum! Hey, how you doing, Chloe? Chloe learned how to make pancakes on my uh, clove hitch video. Which is, uh, you remember my the old days when I used to do the cooking show in the kitchen and uh, teach you how to build carabiner brakes and things like that? Those were the good old days. Avon was only like a year, two years old or something like that. Now she's like freaking 14-year-old teenager with an attitude. Do is untie my climbing knot. 
pull that out of my uh frank climbs is one in the chat box says uh you can ask for take before you undo this which you definitely can which is probably a really good practice um have your belayer holding you while you're still clipped into all of this stuff and it may it allows you to see kind of where your uh where all the load and the weight is going to and it'll lead right directly back to your harness back to this belay loop and you can feel that belay before you start untying anything so that's a nice little addition thank you frank climbs from australia thank you in heaps mike harness pull that slack through the anchor and now i'm essentially ready to lower now you you know what i do yes i put another loop into this and I just take any old quick draw that I peel off of here, clip it to my thing and clip it to the root. root. I know this isn't going to break. And I know this carabiner is probably, you know, wasn't made on, there's a good chance it wasn't made on a Friday night or a Monday morning. So it'll probably survive uh, a lower, but I'm just one of those freaking guys, you know, that deep down inside, I'm a, there's a coward screaming to get out. And so I put a, I just do an overhand loop with the, on, even though on, I never set off belay, and I know my partner yeah. Olivia grab has a draw on belay down in. there. One good practice, fundamental practice to always do is have them take your weight before you unclip from the anchor, and that will help prevent the catastrophic miscommunication error when maybe your partner thought you were going to repel, or for some reason they took you off. This is just another double check in the system. So. This is an excellent plan, you guys. We're uh, Frank was just saying that. Uh, well, I'm glad you found those videos useful, Chloe. Hey, some good. I'm glad they they are some use to you. Uh, we were talking about that excellent practice. Get your belayer, and then if you there is a communication problem. And I think this has been mentioned before, and I've mentioned it before, is this like, fuck, you got to talk to your belayer, right? You got to know before you leave the ground, when you go up to clean that anchor, what you're going to do so that there's no miscommunication. Because I would say eight out of 10 accidents are caused by exactly that. One person thinking one thing, you thinking another thing, and uh, you just kind of unclip and you say, ah, okay, lower, and you go to weight your rope and there's nothing there. Can you imagine? That would be freaking terrifying, eh? So, uh, Olivia, take. Olivia. So I'm going to pull in. All right, now that Olivia is holding my weight. Everything else is and loosened I've up. double checked that. Now I can come out of the system that was holding my weight temporarily while I threaded the rope. Clean up these spare quick draws. Take off my chain reactor. So one argument for having this above the hardware, like having your uh, carabiners, is that when it comes time to clean it, um, it's pretty easy to clean, right? So you're not, because if you weighted this, getting those carabiners out, you'd have to unweight it again. Um, and not always the easiest thing to do when you're pulled in this tight by your belayer, right? Because then you'd have to hold up onto the chains, unweight the thing and, and make that work for you. And uh, I don't really have a problem with the carabiners above these things unless there's something really extraordinarily cross-loading those carabiners but in most cases i i can't recall there being anywhere that i've been that uh, that was really an issue especially these are just bolts you could uh do the same thing with um uh wrap rings which uh, those petzl wrap rings would be here those things are freaking awesome and they're cold steel and i'm ready to lower okay go ahead and lower olivia All right, if the route were a little bit steeper, one little trick that I like to do is unclip the first quick draw at the top that I've come down to, leave it clipped to the rope, clip it to my belay loop, and we call this trolling, and this allows me to stand tight as I go down and be able to unclip the remaining quick draws, especially if it's an overhanging route, really handy technique. Another way to clean the anchor is to thread the actual end of the rope through. So I'm gonna go through a different setup here. This, in this case, we have two 
quick draws as our top rope anchor opposite and opposed, which is totally fine. So I'm just going to use quick draws to anchor myself in, which is a common technique out there. I'm going to pull in a little bit, leave my final chain exposed so I can thread my end, get another quick draw. I'm going to make sure to clip it in opposite that other carabiner. Okay, so now I'm into two quick draws. They're opposite and opposed all the way through, so two independent systems. Go ahead and feed me some slack, Olivia. Notice once again I said slack, not off belay. Now in this case, I'm gonna, let's say the chains are too tight to thread a bite through. So I'm gonna pull up some excess rope, tie a bite knot below, figure eight on a bite here, and clip into a locking carabiner to my belay loop. It's important to go to your belay loop here because now I'm still on belay through this whole transition. If something were to go wrong up here, I'm still on the lead rope. I was going to say that you could do that anywhere, like hook this into the side of your harness or something like that, but this isn't a bad point that you'd still be on belay. The, uh, where you'd, well, I don't know. If you were cleaning that route on the way up, you wouldn't have anything below you, would you? So... Cleaning anchors is more risk than abseiling, way more risk than climbing. Yeah, well, you can see the combination in here, but the risk is minimal if it's done correctly, right? And the risk is marginal if it's done, or maximum if it's done incorrectly. That was a stupid sentence. I had two stupid sentences in a row. Tied into a locking carabiner and still through quick draws below me here in this case. So now I can untie. Pull the rope out of those quick draws. I'm just going to go ahead and clean those up now to Coley chasm. Make my Man, you are getting pretty smart, aren't you? Cleaner, so it's easier to see. I'm going to thread the rope through the chains and retie in using my figure eight knot. If I'm wearing uh, a sweatshirt or thicker clothes, it's important to make sure I get tied in back to the to the proper points of my harness because unlike our belay commands at the ground, I don't have somebody to double check my system up here. Although I am gonna double check it by having Olivia take my weight before I unclip from these. But it's just another little t By taking the weight thing again, good practice I'd say guys. Do that, uh, do that every time. Tip to make sure you don't accidentally tie into the wrong point of your harness. So now I'm gonna make sure everything's threaded, tied back in, do my visual inspections tied in. Now I'm gonna unclip that bite knot that was securing my rope and providing protection. It's gonna drop down, clean this up. Olivia, take, pull it in. Okay, she's holding my weight. The actual climbing rope's under tension and my quick draws that were holding my weight are now slack. So now I can pop those out. This is really good practice, you guys. Get, that, get them to take your weight. Uh, while you're still clipped in, these things should easily unclip after that, and it's easy for you to check that you're tied into the right place, got the right knot, and it's running through both sets of chains. I know this seems really fundamental and uh, um, and, and simple, but you know when you, you guys all remember when you first started doing this shit, it was just like, fuck, this is, it was just a hodgepodge of a bunch of gear, and you're kind of just figuring it out. And, uh, I mean, obviously, you know, you're a smart crowd. Uh, you, you made it work. And probably now this all seems like a little bit uh, elementary or, you know, like beginner's time. But, no, well, I don't know, man. Check it out. Ready to lower. All right. So, once again, these are... He's doing this with real weight on these anchors and things like that. And so that's when you notice if you have your carabiner underneath these chains and things like that, or things are loaded or unloaded, that's when you notice it in, in real weight. When you're standing on the ground and you're not loading these things, you're just putting them stuff, they react differently, or you can put them in a place where you wouldn't be able to put them 
um, at another time, you know, just because the carabiners would be locking themselves up for whatever reason, or this whole ring gets so crowded in there, and then you wait on the rope and your carabiners are underneath it. And uh, so work this stuff out on the ground at home or at your climbing gym or even your local crags. You can use a couple of cams and build an anchor or borrow some from your friends to build an anchor. Run yourself through this thing. And then when you're uh, all set and you think you got it all figured out, go ahead, man. Just like uh, knock yourself out and get up there and clean an anchor or two. But don't go up there trying to learn this uh, your first time ever cleaning an anchor without having a plan in place. So they always have these follow-up things on the um, outdoor research one, which I think is great. Create a clear plan with Blair before you climb. That comes to the communication things I keep talking about. Always stay on belay. Have Blair take your weight prior to unclipping from the anchor. I think those are the key points that we were talking about, eh, guys? Hey, guys. So there you go. Presented by the American Mountain Guides Association, the Mountaineers Outdoor Research, and Petzl. You all see? Executive Director Alan Kostaf, Producer Dana Ladzinski, Technical Director Dale Remsberg, Film and Edit Mark Smiley, Dale Remsberg. And then let's do the acts. Come on, man. Do the act. Seek qualified instruction for utilizing techniques, hire a guide before or become a. Square Productions. Hi, I'm Dale Rimsberg, AMJ instructor team member. Cleaning an anchor at the tops. Okay. Well, you guys, we looked at two different. One was rappelling, not in a bad way, but how to hook up from a, a rappel. And the other is Dale's method of getting lowered off. There's a number of videos out there. I must have looked at 20 of them. I didn't actually, I kind of saw that one with the guy with the green shirt, but I didn't really look at it because I had another one. And that was, this is from REI. You guys, if you're from the States, you know who REI is, I guess. That's the Mountain Equipment Co-op of, uh, but then our Mountain Equipment Co-op got bought out and is owned by a, a huge American consortium. And now they basically don't have, they used to have everything in that freaking MEC. Now they got nothing. There's nothing in there. Uh, this is just a, a fraction of the gear that we used to have. So yeah, these guys do. Climbing to repelling can be a dangerous one because you lose the security of the belay. When it's time to break down your anger, being careful and staying redundant is essential. You may see people top roping or being lowered with the rope running directly through the fixed gear. That's bad etiquette because when a weighted rope slides back and forth through the chains, it wears down the links, which is bad, and can damage your rope, which is worse. To avoid these issues, you'll want to repel after you clean the anchor. You can get lowered off those anchors, you guys. So... You know, it's acceptable to do one lower off of those things. It's probably not the best idea to be top roping off of those. Um, I do sometimes, but then quite often they're my anchors, right? So I, I've done the diligence and I take care of my own crags. So I always carry chains and um, a millions, crescent wrench and stuff to repair. And I suggest you guys start doing that too. You know, there's nothing, if you see a damaged ring or a damaged piece of gear, um, having a Throwing in, you know, like a few mammalians, a piece of chain, uh, a, a bolt hanger, and a small crescent wrench, um, things like that when you go into crags. Nobody's going to get on your case for cleaning or repairing um, equipment. And it shouldn't really be up to um, just one individual. Quite often in, around here, we have one person takes, you know, like so... At the back of the lake, it used to be Peter Arbic and Golovac were doing it all through the 90s uh, to the early 2000s. And then I don't know who's doing the work out there now. Mark Whalen used to do a bunch of work 
over in the Canmore area doing a bunch of the repair stuff, setting up the early first sport climbs, things like that. I used to take care of my crags around here. Um, anything in the backside of tunnel, uh, sunshine crag, those sort of things. I used, I'd put in hundreds of hours of maintenance on those, cleaning it up before it was, became the popular crag that it is now. Nobody will remember that shit. Um, so yeah, I don't know what, uh, if this is, there's anything to be gained by watching Check out our repel video to learn how to get, getting prepared at the top, breaking down the anchor. Okay, you see these things? These things are garbage. These, uh, I was surprised at how weak these actual, uh, you hammer, you, you slide the, the chain in, then you hammer these things shut, but they're not closed in any way, right? So if you actually closed it, took it to your welder and put a bead on that, it would be more of a thing. But they s fail at a surprisingly small rate. And I have seen some of them stretched out and I don't know what that's from, just from top roping. But uh, yeah, um, I'm surprised they use this as an example. So using the actual screw gate mammalians, right, is better. And preparing the rope for your before you can break down your top rope anchor, you'll need to connect yourself directly to the fixed gear with your personal tether. Okay, we've already come to that conclusion. We're going to have a personal tether, right? Um, I prefer that as opposed to using the quick draws, but quick draws will work, and you should know both, actually. Um, let's do a little reading on the chat line here. I have Kevin Schustick. I had my personal anchor beaners get pinched in the anchor bolts on one of my first times cleaning. Now I use smaller nose beaners and clip into the wrap rings. Yeah, yeah, we've all had that happen, Kevin. Frank says, Metolius makes some real small ones. I've got a few of Metolius's real small. I can't believe how small they are, actually. Um, practical enough for Alpine stuff, but uh, pretty slightly impractical on uh, for cragging. You don't need a carabiner that small. Have you come across some videos that are the worst kind, bad practices, questionable information? I have actually, like I said, one Canadian guy. Um, this it was made in 2011, so, but she did a really terrible job. So far, it's the worst one that I've seen. Uh, most of the ones that I've seen out of probably 30 that I looked at since in the last four or five days, because I was kind of thinking, ah, which which ones should you know? My rule of thumb, I think, for you guys, once I look at them all, is like go with these people with accreditation. Because when you have accreditation such as the AMGA, or if you're a large company, um, outdoor research, Petzl, those sort of things, then they sort of have a responsibility either to get it right, or if they made a mistake, they'll take it down um, rather than leave it up. So if they did something that was like of a bad practice, um, you'd probably see that uh, video taken down. But more often than not, people that who are accredited I've uh, done an awful lot of teaching, and so you get your when you're doing a lot of teaching, you get your spiels down. Uh, any mistakes that you're going to make kind of get worked out of the system with the, with your general audience, and then you know people are always asking you questions when you're um, teaching, and you realize, oh no, okay, I, I screwed up and I answered that. So by the time you've done it for a few years, if you're working full time as a guide or something like that, your spiels tend to get pretty polished and uh um you come across pretty clean so but so these guys the amg instructors and stuff like that are out there doing their thing and i really don't know i don't know if this is really worth adding once you've shifted your weight to your personal tether tell your belayer that you're off belay now you can break down your anchor keep the gear organized on your harness and your bulky cord toward the back as you clean you don't want anything getting in the way of either your rappel device or your feet when you're on the way down. With a bunch of rope. Then okay. tie off the slack and clip it to your harness. Okay. That would be very bad. Untie your figure eight and thread the rope through the chains. Is close the system. Tie 
a stop or not in the end of the rope to make sure you can't rappel off the other end of the rope. Once the system is closed, you can unclip the slack from your harness and pull the rope through the chains until you reach the middle. Then call rope on the ground. When you finish cleaning the anchor, you can get ready to rappel. To learn more, check out these videos or click here to find an REI class. Yeah, I don't know. This is freaking redundant sort of thing. So anyhow, let's see, what do we got? We're gonna have a system. We're gonna do dry land this. You're gonna communicate with your belayer. You're gonna make sure before you unclip everything from your anchor, all your safety points that you're gonna have your uh, belayer take your weight. Um, and to answer your stroppy seven ass, you know, come across videos that are the worst kind, bad practices and things like that. Nothing that I saw was actually, um, death, you know, like would lead, would cause, be a cause of death. I think if you did it the, the way that it was demonstrated, but it's probably just not the best practice. Uh, like I say, keep your, uh, um, What was I going to say? I lost my train of thought, guys. Yeah, just keep it simple. Have your, uh, oh, being able to tether, like, you know, like we talked about using either one of these chain, or what do you call this? PAS, uh, personal anchor system. Having a personal anchor system, I really do like these uh, super strong links. I don't wear them around my harness all the time. I tend to keep my harness pretty clean. But for the last time that I go up to clean an anchor or something, then uh, I'll take this along. Quite often, this will either be incorporated as part of my sort of equipment and be using it on an anchor on my way up on multi-pitch climbs, because then I can just go clip, clip and find the ring that you know best suits my my weight, or so that I can get the best equalization that I can. But it works really well. Um, I like having this to extend my anchor. But any version of it will work, just a normal sling. You can do the same sort of thing by tying a few knots into it. The And then uh, you can also do the same thing with a prusset cord. Although a prusset cord is more cumbersome, so using slings will probably be the best. I think I'm going to let you guys go unless you've got any more questions and anything that we should cover tomorrow. Hooking up a rappel, maybe? I don't know. Keeping it, I guess we'll cover all the basics uh over the next few quick links but i want to thank you guys for your help um kevin says i like clipping a bite of rope into my rappel beaner clipped to my belay loop i heard a worn gear loops breaking shame if your rope was clipped into that well well you wouldn't lower off a of gear loops right but yeah um Clipping uh, your rope in, and remember, you guys got to clip that freaking rope in before you start tying and untying it, right? Unless you're doing, I guess, that sort of uh, uh, putting the bite through the uh, rappel end, the rappel rings. Uh, coiling the rope around your foot is a pretty common practice where I come from, or I've used it fucking hundreds of times man just like wrapping a couple of wraps around i got to do some stuff or whatever i'm uh cleaning something or i'm building an anchor or something like that a couple of wraps around my my leg below the blade of ice i feel pretty good with that I, you know, it's never well it hasn't it ain't broke still working um message retracted Thank you for attracting as much as you're keeping. Anyhow, guys, uh, let's talk tomorrow. Um, same sort of time, nine-ish mountain. And uh, we'll cover something else that new and you. I'm not sure what, though. Any suggestions? Kobe V. Kasim, welcome. Glad you stopped in today. And uh, 
How much you can do? What's Kobe's? <clears throat> Anyhow, guys, I'm off. I gotta go start my day. Go uh, get even ready to go to school. She's going to one of those. You want to come back as a Banff kid, right? In your second life, you don't want to come back as a flamingo or an eagle or a seagull. You want to come back as a BAMP kid, trust me. Because yesterday, they just went biking all afternoon to Johnson's Canyon and walked up to the ink pots and then came back, called that a school day. Now, today, they're going to Cascade Ponds. They're biking out there. And then uh, going to pick up a thing of water, look under a microscope at it, and call that a school day. And uh, the number of 30-centimeter flu days that she's had in the wintertime is outrageous but i mean what are you gonna do let your kid go to school when it dumped 30 centimeters on the ground i freaking guess not you know what i mean okay kevin thanks buddy good seeing you frank fixed line techniques oh fixed line techniques and you donated money for a cubicle. Oh, Avon's going to love that. She wants to be a lawyer because she can. Uh, she figures that's where she can do the most good for uh, indigenous people. You know, and then yesterday she went down and she took a pair of old shoes and a teddy bear down to the town hall and left that because the flags are half mast. For those of you who don't know, just recently in Kamloops Residential School, which basically was... Uh, um, I don't even know how it's cultural genocide, the residential school system. And uh, they found 215, the bodies of 215 children that were unaccounted for in a mass grave. So uh, that kind of strikes at home with her. And she's decided she's going to, for now, she's decided. So she needs that cubicle fund, guys. She needs that cubicle money so that she can uh, um, do the most good for the indigenous people in Canada. Anyhow, hasta luego. We'll talk to you guys later. It's shoe stick. And I don't even know. Kevin shoe stick. Okay, buddy. Kevin shoe stick. Whoa, okay. Really, buddy? Yeah, I know. Anyhow, it's the indigenous people of Canada have really had a, you know, a uh, real bad go of it, and it's left uh, people pretty depressed around my neighborhood here. Good day, sir. Thanks for the great reviews and tips. See you, Frank. Hasta luego, buddy. See you, uh, Kevin and Kevin and all you guys.